All righty, ladies and gentlemen, what say we get this started? Uh, how's the sound for everyone? Good? Okay, because we've got a, a good, good sized room here. My name is James A. Owen. I'm an author and illustrator. Uh, I've been working in publishing for going on 35 years now. I started when I was very young. And uh, I appreciate all of you who came to listen to this presentation today, especially those of you who signed up early when all Craig had listed on the schedule was the words Eggs Benedict <laughs> with no description. <laughs> and I saw a number, <laughs> well, you know, um, depends on the day. Um, the fact that a lot of people were intrigued by that, uh, I, I thought was a lot of fun. And then Craig went back in and amended that and added a little bit more of a description. But the Eggs Benedict uh, presentation is something that started as an anecdote at the Superstars Writing Seminar, where I'm one of the founders and partners. And it turned into something larger and more significant. And so it became an actual ticketed event at Superstars. And that is one where a breakfast is involved. Um, but we also had a lot of people at other writing events that were interested in hearing the things that I teach with this story. And so we, we developed it um, a bit more as a, a keynote address that we could do at other writing conferences. And so that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you today. Um, most of the work that I have done uh, has been traditionally published. I have always maintained my own imprint, so I've always had one foot in indie and one foot in traditional. And with my traditional publisher, Simon & Schuster, as they were publishing this series of books of mine that I wrote and illustrated, they started sending me out on these, these book tours. And I got accustomed to getting a little bit of a routine before events. Uh, when I worked in comic books full time, some of the other marketing people that I knew that were going city to city throughout the year, you ended up at the same hotels, at the same comic book conventions, the same group of friends, so you end up having the same you know, group for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in different cities all throughout the spring and summer. And a couple of guys and I got into the habit of ordering Eggs Benedict. That became sort of our, our good luck start to the event. And so I carried that forward into my book tours. Anytime I was starting an event in a city, I would try to have Eggs Benedict, the first breakfast that I was there just as that little good luck reminder. So on one of these book tours, I was in a, a city in Texas and they had me in one of those uh, old fashioned hotels, a little older, been renovated over the years, but it had one of those restaurants built into the ground floor. It was a family restaurant. So I went downstairs and, and took a seat in the restaurant and the waiter came over and he said, well, sir, good morning. What can I get you for breakfast? And I says, well, tell me, how's your eggs, Benedict? And he said, man alive, am I ever glad that you asked me that? Because hands down, eggs, Benedict is the best thing we do. And I said, really? And he says, absolutely. This restaurant was founded by my grandparents who trained my parents, who trained me. I am the head chef who trains all of our staff. I trained them each on every recipe that was created by my grandmother. And Eggs Benedict was the best of the best. And I said, really? And he's like, absolutely. He's like, can, can you smell that? They just pulled a fresh batch of English muffins out of the ovens just now. On my way into work this morning, I gathered those eggs fresh from the hen house. We cooked the hollandaise sauce anew every 15 minutes to make sure it is absolutely at peak freshness. And I even named the pig that that ham came from. So every ingredient that has been assembled and expertly prepared for your breakfast was carefully, lovingly done so you have the best experience you can possibly have to start your day. And I promise you, if you order the Eggs Benedict, you will not regret it. And I said, well, I guess I'm gonna have to order the Eggs Benedict. And he said, absolutely. 
Wonderful choice, sir. I'm going to go back and let my chef know. And he went back into the kitchen through those swinging doors, and I could see some activity through that little round porthole window in the door. And then I saw his face appear, and he was gesturing to somebody, and waving him over, and I saw this other face appear, and the guy points at me, and the other guy looks at me. I nodded. They both gave me a thumbs up, and they went to work. And I sat there, watching the waiter and the rest of the staff, dealing with the rest of the customers, and I was excited. I was excited about my breakfast. And every time the door swung open, I thought, is it, is it my turn? Back and forth they went, serving the rest of the customers until finally the head chef and the chef in the kitchen came through that door with a covered tray and they came over and sat it at my table and lifted the tray, the cover, and it smelled extraordinary. And then they both just stood there and looked at me. <laughs> And I looked at them and I, I took my knife and my fork, I cut into it, I took a bite, and he says, well, sir, how'd we do? And I said, this is absolutely amazing. And he says, thank you very much. We're gonna let you enjoy your breakfast. And they went back to work and I sat there eating one of the best Eggs Benedict breakfasts I'd ever had in my life. Now, as I was eating this and enjoying it, my mind was turning. I'm trying to, to understand what made this so special. Because for those of you that, that may not know, um, Eggs Benedict is a bit of a unique breakfast. But it's an English muffin, a poached egg, slice of ham, and hollandaise sauce. And I've had really good ones and I've had some so-so ones. And I started trying to figure out what was so unique about this particular Eggs Benedict. So I started looking it over, and it was an English muffin, poached egg, slice of ham, and hollandaise sauce. And it was fresh, and it had been expertly prepared. But for some reason, I was enjoying it more than any I'd had in years. And that's when I realized what that critical ingredient was. He sold it to me. He elevated my expectations for something that no one elevates your expectations for breakfast, but he did. He elevated my expectations and then he delivered something that had been expertly prepared. And I enjoyed it more because I was aware that there was care put into this, that it was important to him that I would enjoy this experience. Now, how much different would that experience have been if I had said, how's your eggs Benedict? And instead of the answer he gave me, he answered more like this. Well, you know, it's, it's okay, uh, I guess. Uh, there's, there's better stuff on the menu, better recipes. I, I always wanted to make a really great Eggs Benedict, um, but finding the time to learn how to do it's difficult. And uh, I wanted to do it when I was younger. I, I did one once my mom really liked. Um, I guess I should try and do it more. I'd love to make a living making great Eggs Benedict, but I don't know. I don't know, there's gonna be a lot of work put into it and it's just so so hard to find the time and then you got to get it right and what if people don't like it and I just I, you could order it and try it if you want I guess hey, do any of those phrases sound familiar to anybody in this room <laughs> about an entirely different subject have any of those phrases been said by anybody in this room have you even thought those things when someone has approached you about your work? Now, let's be really clear about what it is that we all actually do. We think up stuff in our heads that's so cool, we're going to charge other people money to know what it is. That is our job. 
Now, part of the problem, and, and I see this so often with people in, in creative arts, especially with authors, is we've been conditioned by the world to believe that pride is wrong and humility is virtuous. And that's not exactly true. False humility really does no one any good. If people at this conference practiced false humility, it would not be doing any of us any good. My first book in that series from Simon & Schuster, um, it is still selling, still in hardcover, 16 years on. It's published in 22 languages. I sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It doesn't do aspiring authors any good for me to stand up here, look at my shoes, shuffle my feet, and say things like, well, hopefully one day this author thing's gonna work out. Because that's, that's not true. It has worked out. It's worked out spectacularly well. Proper pride is what we should be going for. Because proper pride is knowing you do something well and expressing that. And there is nothing wrong with that. Improper pride is when you start making comparisons. And comparisons benefit no one, especially in the creative arts. One book is going to be entirely different from another book, and there's no value in somebody saying, I am better at this than you, because all the parameters are different. But there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm really good at this. I did something that I think you're going to like. You should try it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And I think that's, that's important. Um, it's important to practice proper pride in what we do because so much of what we do, especially as indie authors, is in the marketing of it. So many expectations are put on us to present the work and pitch the work and sell the work. Now think about what you have done what you have worked at and earned and sacrificed just to get to the point you are at right now. Think about all those hours and months and years of honing your craft, of getting those word counts in, of refining it and editing it, finding time on buses, finding time on airports, in between taking the kids to school, on your break at work, all those stolen moments so you can put the words down to express these things that mean so much to you in the hopes of creating stories that will have value to other people so that you can not only share your work but build a career. Now why, when you have put in so much effort and blood and sweat and tears and hopes and dreams focused on this creative work, why after you've done all that would you sell yourself short at that point where somebody asks, how's your eggs Benedict? Because that's the moment that you have an opportunity to say, my eggs Benedict is awesome. This is what mine is, this book, this series, these series, all of these things that I've worked at, I'm really good at it. These books are really good, give it a try you're not gonna be disappointed. And one of the reasons that that is so important and one of the reasons why that's an important thing that I like to teach at conferences like this is based on one specific principle. No one ever inspired anyone else to greatness by pretending to be less awesome than they actually are. None of the people on the panels throughout this week are gonna inspire any of you to greatness in your own work and careers by pretending we're less successful than we've been, by pretending to be less awesome than we actually are at doing work that we love. Now that doesn't mean that the world is gonna embrace your work. It doesn't mean what you do is going to appeal to everyone. If what you're doing appeals to everyone, you haven't reached enough readers yet. That's a simple truth. If you've gotten no bad reviews, 
you haven't gotten enough reviews yet. Because as I was just discussing with a couple of my friends here, as of today, there are about 8 billion people on this planet. That was an actual news headline, 8 billionth person born today. And I believe there are enough of them out there who are going to like what you specifically do for you to earn a living doing what you love. The technology exists now for us to be able to facilitate that work and to reach those people more so now than ever before. And it doesn't mean your work can't improve. We all have chances to improve the work we're doing. Doesn't mean it's gonna to be to everyone's taste. But you know what, that's okay. What's important, what's significant about what you're choosing to do is that it fulfills something in you. And when you present that openly and unafraid, and when you do that with proper pride, the people that it's going to resonate with are going to feel that, they're going to see that, they're gonna see the pride in your face. That's what communicates the years of effort and work and hope that you have put into that book. When I worked in comic books, um, I had a, a mentor, a guy named Dave Sim, that did this massive uh, comic book project called Cerebus. And he was one of the people that taught me actually how to be a professional at signings. Um, I'm also an illustrator. So he taught me that if you can draw for people on demand, you will never have a bad signing. You go to a signing and three people show up. If you can actually sketch for them, they're gonna be happy, the store's gonna be happy, and you'll have had a successful event. Um, the, the repercussions of that advice that I couldn't have foreseen at the time was that I now draw in almost every book that I sell, and a good portion of my income goes to buying Sharpies. But I've always had good events because of things that he taught me. And, and it was not just drawing, it was engaging. If you can engage with the people that are there to see you, that's what's important. There was a documentary um, that came out a few years ago about a band called Anvil. The wonderful documentary about a band that they were supposed to rise like this and they crashed like this, but they had talent, they had abilities, they had a following. And they, they put on this new tour that did not go well, and that was the heart of this documentary. And they showed a couple of clubs where the band's on stage, and there's two guys. Two guys showed up for that show. And your first response in watching that was, oh, oh, that's too bad. And then they switched to the band, and they said, that's our biggest fans. How can we not put on our best show for the two guys who showed up to see us? That's the kind of connection that you want to have. Now, Dave um, talked about a mentor that he had when he was, he was coming up as a comic book artist. And his mentor was a guy named Gene Day. And Gene was the type that was always working. In, in publishing, we talk about you're always submitting. You're always sending in short stories or books. You're always working on something. And Gene was the kind that he was doing spot illustrations for newspapers and comic books and fanzines and posters. And, and he always had a cup of coffee, always had a cigarette dangling off of one corner of his mouth. And they would work together in each other's studios just to have the, the camaraderie, a little bit of company. And one day Dave got really frustrated with what he was working on. And Gene says, what's the problem? And Dave said, it's this hand I'm drawing. I just, I can't get it right. And Gene got up from his desk and ambled over, looked over Dave's shoulder, shrugged, and said, huh, it's a Dave Sim hand. And then went back to work. And Dave suddenly realized the reason he was frustrated with that was he had put conditions on his own drawing that had nothing to do with the drawing. What he was loading on top of that work was other people's expectations or his own expectations of what he thought other people might expect 
of what they thought it should look like when he already knew how to do it. He already knew how to do something expertly. And the expectations of people outside of him were not as important as that understanding. You are the world's foremost authority on the work that you have created. And because of that fact, you can't do it wrong. You cannot do it wrong. What you create may not be to the taste of other people around you. There may be criticism. There may be people that simply just don't like what you did. And that's okay, because if you're content with the thing that you have made, if you did it to the best of your abilities, and it's something that you feel has value, that is literally all that should matter, because you cannot do it wrong. And how you present yourself and your work is important because people very often start their estimation of your value at your estimation of your own. They take that as a starting point. Now, when I'm doing this talk at Superstars, we have it in smaller groups in the mornings throughout the days of, of the conference. And I usually have about uh, 20 to 24 people in a small banquet room at the Antlers Hotel. And as I'm doing this to try to get across the story, as I'm talking, I am constantly breaking away and going back into the kitchen to check on the English muffins and the hollandaise sauce and the eggs and the ham and check on the staff of the chef who is preparing their breakfast. I do it about four times throughout that presentation. So the people attending are watching me supervising their breakfast being made. I didn't create those recipes. I'm not the one doing that cooking. But in those occasions, I have partnered myself with the people who are. And I have gone in early that morning beforehand and talked to the staff and explained to them what I'm about to teach in that little session and explained to them how important it is that they come through for me. And I tell them, I am presenting this as one of the best breakfasts they're ever going to have. You do this every day. You have refined your skills. You know how to do this expertly. This is a moment where I hope you will pull together all of your experience to help me teach this principle to my friends. Now, the last several years, it has been the same team there. Chef Carlos, who is awesome, and he looks forward to me showing up every year, and his staff is like, oh, Mr. Owen's here. All right, is today the day? It's the day. And they go running around that kitchen. I have seen them set aside trays of food as not appropriate for the Eggs Benedict breakfast. <laughs> now, in terms of how the attendees take this, about six years ago, there was a little bit of a regime change at the Antlers Hotel, and we had a manager who was not interested in me going into their kitchen at all. He did not want me working with that staff. He did not want me going back there. He's like, no, no, our contract is, we're giving you the room, we're providing you with these breakfasts. I don't want you interfering with our chefs. And I shared a little bit of this with the attendees, some of whom had done it before and, and didn't know why I wasn't going back to work with the chef. And when the sullen-faced people pushed out their little trays and brought around the breakfasts, that was a different kind of lesson because the enthusiasm level in the room went way down and it had nothing to do with me. But it did have to do with my creative partners in that venture who didn't understand what we were trying to do. 
So it's a bit of a relief for me when I show up and, and I see Chef Carlos is still there. <laughs> because when we do sit down to eat, everyone goes a bit quiet. And I join them, I sit down to eat as well, and I'm watching. I'm watching these people have the same experience I did at that little place in Texas so long ago because they're examining their food and they're smiling and they're talking to their neighbors and everyone is enjoying this shared experience of a breakfast that people have had dozens of times throughout their life. And they're all realizing, he, he showed us how this magic trick works and it still works. Because when you legitimately raise people's expectations of life, it doesn't matter how you do it. Once you've done it, they tend to stay at that point. They tend to stay there, especially when you deliver on what you've promised. And as we finish our breakfast, we do one more thing. I go back into the kitchen one more time and I bring out Chef Carlos. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the man who created the breakfast for you today. And they applaud him. And more than once, I have seen that man get tears in his eyes. And he thanks them, he thanks me, he shakes my hand, he goes back to work. And then we have one more discussion. And I said, now, I want you to think about what his day consists of. He is the head chef at a hotel restaurant. His mornings start very early and they run to late afternoon and he is producing hundreds and hundreds of breakfasts as fast as they can make them. They're all expertly done. It is good food, it is well prepared. But for the most part, he never sees the people that he is serving. To know that the people he is serving are going to appreciate his efforts and his skill and his training and his career choice and applaud him for it. What do you think that's done to the rest of his day? You have elevated his experience in something that is completely unrelated to what we're at this conference for. And that to me, maybe the most significant thing about this is that we don't exist in a vacuum. We get to come to these conferences and live in these pockets of time and place where we're surrounded by a thousand people who have the same aspirations and desires and hopes that we do. But we're surrounded the rest of our lives by millions more that are looking and trying to find some sort of meaning in their lives and hope in their lives. And that is something that we can do, not just in the, the stories that we tell, fiction or nonfiction. Those stories that we are creating are our way of communicating with other people and other cultures. And people are starving for that kind of connection. They're starving for people who are happy doing what they do who have found contentment doing work that they love. Now, the last several years, a lot of things have shifted in publishing. There's been this huge shift over towards indie, but even all the traditional publishers are expecting authors to do the bulk of the work that has largely been put on our shoulders. When you choose to go indie, you take that on from the first step. But that's why it's important for you to understand how you present, how you present yourself is significant. I see people that are confident in their work, but they talk about, they talk about their writing career sometimes as if it's a piece of luck that hasn't happened to them yet. And Craig Martell is gonna be one of the first to tell you it, it has to be deliberate. You have to, you have to choose this and you have to support it with your words and how you present. And if you've chosen to be an author, 
Books are your trade and your craft and your livelihood. And you have to be confident about how you present that. Now, last year, the concept of Eggs Benedict took on a little bit of a new dimension and one that ended up being slightly more personal uh, for me. My son, Nathaniel, was graduating from high school and right at the end of his senior year, a group of alumni established basically a, a business scholarship, was the largest scholarship ever established at Snowflake High School in Arizona. And they ran through some screenings of students uh, who were competing for this. They came up with a, a final group of seven. And the week before the week before graduation, they gathered them all in the principal's office, handed each one of them an envelope with $100 in it, and said, that's a loan. You have until Friday to develop that $100 loan into a viable business. And Friday at 5 o'clock, you are going to come back in with a report, repay the loan, tell us how successful your business was, and deliver a video explaining the whole process of what you did. Go. Now, a couple of the kids, right away, they're like, we're going to do a raffle, a $100 gift card. There we go. <laughs> that did not really fly. <laughs> a couple of them figured, OK, we'll do some sort of smash ball tournaments something where people pay an entry fee and we'll use the money to buy um, what the prizes will be. One young lady uh, who already had a photography business said, can I invest that $100 loan in an existing business venture? And they said, absolutely, you can. Then there was my son, Nathaniel, um, who, who being my son, he had already had two successful businesses that he had started. He'd watched some documentary about me starting a publishing company as a teenager. He started his first business the week before he turned 15. And I said, why was it so important that you did it this week? And he said, because you had your first business in 14 and I've got to keep up with my old man. His business was called Goat Zen Fine Apparel. He used the money from a prize-winning lamb and the grand champion turkey at the Navajo County Fair to manufacture goat-themed Christmas ties in China. I, I asked him about that, the ties. His uncle and I helped design them for him. Um, it's called the, Ghost of, uh, the Goats of Christmas Present. And he said, I found the manufacturer there in, in Beijing. And I said, really? And he's like, they're human rights compliant, Dad. I saw the video on their certificate. And I thought, all right and he manufactured it. And then he started um, an engraving business. He apprenticed to the man who makes the Eisner Awards for the San Diego Comic-Con. The laser is at my studio because that, that fellow is a good friend of mine. And uh, he started an engraving business and started cold calling places. I've been a guest at the Phoenix Comic-Con, now called Fan Fusion, ever since they started. And so he's grown up attending these conventions with me. He cold called the Phoenix Comic Con, not mentioning he was James Owen's son, and said that he had a laser engraving business if they had any awards they needed done. And they said, actually, we just got a new budget for the Masquerade Awards. We used to have those little cup trophies. We want to do laser cut uh, ruby acrylic phoenixes for the awards set into a base. And our budget's $1,000. Can you do these for that? And he said, I absolutely can. They, they had no idea he was 15 years old. We showed up um, to set up at Comic-Con, and the owner came over to say hi and give me a hug. And I said, so what do you think about those new awards for the masquerade? And he says, How? nobody knows about that. And I said, I know about it because I help package them and deliver them. And he said, really? And I said, I know the owner of Capra Custom Creations. And he says, really, who? And I pointed where my son was hanging the banner at our booth. And then he goes, oh, is he behind Nathaniel? And I said, no, it was Nathaniel that did that. And he got a shout out at the uh, masquerade that night in a ballroom full of 5,000 people. So he'd had this experience already. So competing for this scholarship, he spent a day just thinking about it. 
And he was a big YouTube fan, so he'd been observing people like Casey Neistat and how they make those YouTube videos. And the plan that he came up with for a viable business was to make, with a laser, wooden key tags that say, how's your eggs Benedict? And the premium version was a frame where you would mount a copy of the cover of your best or most recent book with your name, the book's title, and how's your eggs Benedict on it. And he marketed that to the Superstars writing seminars and all the people who've been having breakfast, breakfast with me for the last decade. And when the tallies were done, on Friday, he delivered a very expert video that was pretty amazing for his age. And of the, I believe it was a little over $2,000 that those seven kids managed to generate in just five days, more than half of that was Nathaniel's. And he got the scholarship that he went to college on his first year. Now, the reason I mentioned that, there are people here at this conference right now carrying around some of those wooden tags. Wolf Moon, who has developed into an amazing writing teacher, posts photos of his eggs Benedict at every conference and convention he goes to. So it wasn't just a business initiative that happened during the course of that five days. Nathaniel tapped into something larger. He tapped into something more meaningful for people about giving themselves permission to remind themselves to elevate their own expectations of what they do. Now, when you talk about how you pitch yourself, this has to be something that you reinforce for yourself on a regular basis. That is a big part of the value of conferences like 20 books and superstars, because you are surrounding yourself with people who are ready to help lift you up and support you, who are gonna tell you that they believe in you and the book that you have and the work that you're doing. And it's okay to, it's okay to say that you believe your work is good. That's really what all of this comes down to. I've seen so many people that have done the work and have the books and they've done the publishing. And then when it comes down to actually presenting it to someone, they struggle with it. And I understand that too. I've been through those times too. I have had those moments too. And, and sometimes you have to be the one reinforcing it for yourself. There was an opportunity I had years ago to work with a large magazine publisher. They were one of the biggest publishers in the, in the country. And I had produced this arts magazine called International Studio. And I'd done some of the articles, I designed it, um, I published it. And I had this meeting with this, this president of this company. And he looked through the magazine and he asked me a few questions. And then finally, he just put it on his desk and he sat there and looked at me. And he said, what are you? And I said, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. And he said, okay, you are an artist, you're an author. You've done books, you've done comic books. You're a publisher, you designed this magazine You wrote some of the articles. So you're one of the primary contributors. And I said, well, my rates were good. And he said, you do all these different things and we're talking about investing in you, but I need to know what you are. What are you? Are you an artist? Are you an author? Are you an entrepreneur? What are you? And I thought about that for a moment. And then I said, Mr. Wolgamuth, I'm a merchant prince in training to become a philosopher king. And he sat back and realized I wasn't being facetious, but I meant it. And what I meant was I have big ambitions. 
I have some big plans, and I mean to see them through. We all just sat through an opening panel this morning <laughs> where at least two of the authors on that opening panel had done more than 100 books. Uh, the one sitting at the end, what, she said 245 books with 50 more to come over the next two years. Those were numbers I had not expected to hear, but I was kind of amazed. There are people out there who have set their expectations here, and they're doing the work to meet those expectations. They're the ones who have come here to share their insights with you and their wisdom with you. This is an opportunity to absorb all of those lessons that they're teaching and to go off of those examples. If someone sitting on that stage has written 250 books, it's doable, it's within range. Those goals are achievable for all of us. And here's, here's the other significant thing. Your goals don't have to match anyone else's. It's not in duplicating what other people have done that makes you significant and successful. It's how well you serve your own goals in the pursuit of this as a career. It's how well you find your own level of contentment with the work that you are doing. Because as was also said on that panel this morning, you also have to find a way to be happy. There are ways to make money that will not make you happy. There are ways to do all of this work and not make it viable as a career. But the fact that you are here at this conference that's most of the battle. You being here has indicated how serious you are about learning and improving your craft. And what all of these panels are hopefully doing for you is elevating your own expectations of your own work and your experience here and your connections you are making with this large expanded tribe of people who have the same aspirations and goals and dreams and fears because we have all had those exact fears. What I hope that you can take away from, from having come to this session is understanding that you are worthy, is understanding that your work has value. And now, the one thing you have to do is convince yourself that it's all right to express that to the people around you. When you're talking craft with your close friends, that's a different thing. You can talk about the things that are driving you crazy and you can talk about the problems and oh, that one editor that never answers your email and things like that. But when you are talking to people about your work, especially readers, I'm giving you permission right now absolute permission. Anybody ever questions you, you can say, James Owen gave me permission to talk about it this way. Because sometimes that's all people need. You want to say that you believe in your own work. You want to say that you think it's good. You know what? If you're at this point, it already is. Get out of your own way. Just get out of your own way and present it with the value that it already has. And I promise you, the people your work resonates with will find it. They will find you. They will find ways to continue to read your work and support you and buy your books and spread the word because you will have elevated their expectations and then given them something that was expertly crafted with all the heart you have and all the effort that you've put into it. And that's what's most important in anything, not just our books. If we can walk through our lives believing that about ourselves and our own value, that elevates people around us. It elevates the people that backed my son. It elevates that chef at the antlers. It elevates everyone when you can walk through life with proper pride saying, I am good at this. 
If you try what I do, if you try my work, I think you're going to like it. Because that's the answer you need to give. Every question in life is, how's your eggs benedict? Your best answer is, my eggs benedict is awesome. And that's all I've got to share with you today, except to say thank you for being such a great audience.